We're so excited to be here today and talk about a topic that uh, is kind of controversial, but is emerging as an important element in that whole conversation and the ethos of nutrition as a treatment for cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease, which is ketogenic diet. We've talked about this in the past, and we've been trying to keep in touch with the latest research that is coming to us to be objective about it. And in the last 10 years, there's been a lot of research that has been done on ketogenic diet. And so we wanted to kind of give an overview of what we have learned recently and whether this needs to be applied at a population level or not. But before we go on, uh, just for the sake of uh, completeness, we want to make sure that we highlight the work we do in the communities, which is Healthy Minds Initiative. Uh, amazing work we do with the com uh, com African American communities, the minority communities, actually all communities that have not had access to healthcare. We won that National Academy of Medicine award for this, and we are incredibly proud of that uh, work. The other thing we want to highlight is our neuroacademy.com. For those of you who are interested in the only way that health and brain health is translatable, which is a science-based, community-based, data-driven environment where people can actually, on a daily basis, just get the right amount of information to change their lives, come to neuroacademy.com. And we think it's the most effective way to change your life, your behavior, your habits, but also optimize your brain health. So that's a little bit of advertisement we wanted to start with. Uh, uh, looking forward to seeing you guys there. All right, continue. So uh, today we wanted to talk about one of the controversial topics that I should talked about, which is ketogenic diet. Before anything, we want to make sure that we create a relationship with the audience around what Stephen Covey said, speed of trust, trusting integrity and capacity. And part of that integrity part is trans, you know, being able to, to, um, put out your biases ahead of time, a priori. That's critical for people to know that the person that's speaking to them, they're not you know, loaded in one direction, that they're actually open to data. And, and the way we can do that is kind of put out our own a priori biases that we've talked about and, and then tell you how those biases are being checked. One of the biases that, that we have is we're plant-based for multiple reasons, for health, for environment, for animals, uh, otherwise. But we are not the kind of scientists that say this is the only way and that's it. We believe about optimizing health uh, with the person in mind, with the individual in mind, not um, a monosyllabic, a, a huge idea that everybody has to follow. It has to be data-driven and it has to be around how each person can find themselves in that journey. And sometimes it's different for different people, but it still has to be data-driven. So that's the one bias. The other bias that we might have is actually a good bias that we're very heavily data-driven. Uh, and the, but I call it a bias is because some people say that, oh, that just because you have data, it doesn't mean that it's translatable to communities, to individuals. Well, we've taken that into consideration. Our work, and I think singularly, has been in the communities, to look at the communities and how you can translate what's been found at the individual level, not just as a talking point on social media and, and some, some, some nice memes, but at the individual level, at the community level, how each community can truly incorporate something long-term. So those are the two um, uh, pieces of information we wanted to start with, but um, now we can get into ketogenic diet which is incredibly popular. I'm really glad that you actually introduced the conversation by highlighting the biases because it's very important for the audience to understand where we're coming from. Yeah. And there has been some criticism in the past as far as us being plant-based and, you know, completely, you know, deflecting some of the things that is coming to us. And that's not the case. We are going to be uncomfortable and make sure that we present the data as it is, as science um, has translated into it. So with that said, let's dive into it. Yeah, I, I love this concept of uh, discomfort. We, we are a big believer of comfort with discomfort, and only in that realm can you find the truth. So uh, we will delve into this data. So first Amazing. about ketogenic di diet a bit. Um, you can't turn uh, in any direction without finding something in the media and social media on YouTube, on uh, Instagram and the newsstands. We were just traveling um, and in the airport 
and every oh, newsstand there was everywhere. one magazine article yeah. that spoke about ketogenic diet, which which is which is fine and 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 uh, that's that's part of the way societies and communities gather information and over time distill to to the uh, to the truth. We are very much optimists in the sense that we think that reason and and data and truth ultimately find uh, themselves in the bigger population. We are. Um, reason-driven beings. Although emotions are powerful, but for the most part, we are reason-driven beings. And the evidence of that is our history, throughout history. There's always resistance to truth and there's some even some fallback, but but truth always manifests eventually. So, so we're true. very much uh, optimistic that whatever that truth is when it comes to diet and nutrition, it will manifest eventually. And even we want to be part of that conversation, but an accurate part of that conversation, making mm -hmm. sure that data is uh, the driver. Excellent. Now, ketogenic diet, we want to start with defining it. Then I'll go into some other diets that have actually been around for a while, um, for actually more than a few decades. If, if, you, if truth be told, it started with in the 1920s, actually, even earlier than that, there are evidence in the 1700s, people talking about a particular type of food, eating a particular type of fruit. In, in, in fact, um, uh, Ligu uh, Cornaro, I killed that name. And, and, uh, Luigi. Luigi. <laughs> Ligu <laughs> and Luigi uh, uh, Cornaro in 1558 spoke about a, um, um, a diet that would reduce weight. He's an Italian um, um, writer, and uh, he was. And, and so even as far back as then, and then if you look at the different religions, each of them had their limitations, not just for weight loss, but for health, mm -hmm. whether it was a, a, a particular religions that uh, abstained from pork or from shell uh, uh, um, organisms or from uh, coffee or from other. But the, the thought of having... A, a perspective on diet and health that has always been there since we've had language and beginnings of consciousness. That word, that's a completely different uh, topic. concept, topic. Yeah. <laughs> but nonetheless, <clears throat> that's that's where we are. But first, let's define uh, ketogenic diet. Yeah, so the ketogenic diet is essentially a high-fat, low-carbohydrate um, diet with controlled amount of protein. Now, the proportion of carbohydrates in the food uh, ration is less than about 10%. Most of the clinical trials that put people on a ketogenic diet, they go between 8 to 15% and usually around 10%. And when our supply of carbohydrate is so low, it causes fatty acids to be converted to ketone bodies. And these ketone bodies are used as the main energy substrate when glucose which is the brain's main energy source, is in short supply. And so different models of ketogenic diet are, are used depending on the goal of therapy. And uh, we want to talk about, you know, what actually happens in the body when people are given a ketogenic diet, what kind of compounds are used, and what do they do for brain cells? It's, it's remarkable. I'll talk about the energetics and how energy is utilized. Uh, but this diet actually first came to us in the 1920s uh, with the treatment of patients we deal with, right. uh, epilepsy mm -hmm. um, and seizures, uh, it's particular, in particular um, children's epilepsies, um, Lennox-Gastaut and, and many other epilepsies that were intractable, that were not treatable with one, two, or even three anti-seizure medications. And ketogenic diet was <clears throat> an additional therapy. So exactly. it wasn't the mainstay of the therapy. It essentially was introduced when children were on multiple medications and they didn't really see any effect. They didn't see any reduction in their epilepsy as much as possible, ketogenic diet was added on top of it. And even now, you know, lennox gastro syndrome patients are put on ketogenic diet and it seems to be helpful. Yeah, there, there definitely was evidence of benefit. There's no question of that. And and those are great data because we have data on, on those populations for years and years yeah. and we've seen efficacy. And this has been around for a long time. I think it was introduced back in the 1920s. Uh, yeah, exactly. That's, um, so that's that's that we have data on both um, um, its efficacy, its utility, <clears throat> and also side effects. We have plenty of data as far as side effects is concerned, and uh, more importantly, because we don't have that much data on ketogenic diet in large populations over a long period of time, this is a good model where we have um, evidence of uh, ketogenic diet being able to sustain. Um, a ketosis in the blood for long, long periods of time 
and seeing effect, both a uh, long-term brain effect um, um, and not just seizure reduction, but other consequences or benefits as well. Right. So that's uh, that's uh, one benefit. But over the last few years, decades actually, uh, it has been used in many other conditions as well, um, uh, be it um, other neurological diseases, cancers, even cancers like glioblastoma multiforme, which is a very aggressive brain cancer that doesn't have much of a treatment. Yeah. Um, and it's been sh um, used in those the, the circumstances as well and, and some of those definite benefit. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about those, uh, the data on, on ketogenic diet as we go forward. But ketogenic diet, is people think of it as, as an extension of Atkins diet, but it's actually quite different. Yeah, Atkins diet was actually a high protein diet. Well, one reality of ketogenic diet is that it it doesn't uh, focus on protein if anything it wants lower levels of protein because if you have high protein it can convert to glucose it can convert to energy so one thing that people have to know we have four basic macromolecules that make us i mean I'm, and you have nucleic acids which is dna and rna that's not used for energy that's not used for um, the building blocks that's the information carrying um, molecule then you have proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. All of them are used in both structure and function and energy. The, the most common source of energy, um, especially acute energy, is carbohydrates. Yeah. Um, um, long-term energy is fat because it's stored and it's used long-term. But both of them can be used short-term and long-term. And protein is used as a last resort. Uh, uh, for energy. When you don't have other sources, protein is broken down to amino acids. Amino acids are broken down into um, um, uh, the components that then go into the citric acid uh, cycle and into the um, cellular uh, utilization of energy, and it's used as energy. So the the pattern of Atkins is, is quite different from a ketogenic diet. Yes, yeah. you can have high-fat uh, uh, Atkins and low-fat Atkins, but you can't have low protein Atkins. That's uh, true, so that's because the, that's the mainstay. The mainstay. So as far as carbohydrates are concerned, normally carbohydrates and foods are converted into glucose, which is you know the, the breakdown product of carbohydrates. And it's transported around the body and it's a very important fuel for brain function. But if little carbohydrate remains in the diet, like in the ketogenic diet or in the Atkins diet, the liver converts fat into fatty acids and ketone bodies. And then the ketone bodies have the capacity to pass into the brain easily without involving multiple channels. I think one of the one of the concepts of using ketogenic diet in Alzheimer's disease has been just that, where there is dysfunction in the metabolism of glucose. Glucose has difficulty being transported into the brain and brain cells, but ketoge ketogenic diet or the ketone bodies that are produced um, due to the consumption of a ketogenic diet replaces glucose as an energy source. Exactly, and and th that matters because because that might speak to benefit in certain states and not other states. If, if you have difficulty transporting, we might be jumping ahead of ourselves, but that's good because this is, this is relevant here. If, if you have difficulty transporting glucose, and difficulty transporting glucose is not a normal state for the majority of population, uh, then you might need alternate paths of energy transport. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. I mean, uh, uh, so we will explore that as well uh, as we go forward. But the, the key here is to know that there are, there are the, the energy metabolism pathway is the, is the process that, that, that truly is consequential here. There might be other pathways that have been uh, thought about that maybe ketone bodies affect um, how amyloid, which is the bad protein that gets into the cell, or how it affects NAD and how it affects other um, and, um, enzymes. But none of those have been truly you know, uh, corroborated or validated properly. So we don't have evidence of that. And the other thing that we have to know is that um, the, the most efficient um, source of energy for the brain is glucose. 100% of the cells of the body uses glucose, but 80% of the cells, as far as we know, uh, use uh, ketones as energy. But here's the thing. Um, through cellular respiration, you create 36 ATPs or a significant amount of ATPs, which is the energy unit of the cell. Um, and and for through um, uh, ketones, you do as well. You do quite a bit of um, uh, production of energy units. So you don't lose any, any energy as far as that transformation is concerned. So let's be transparent as far as that. 
there is no inefficiency when you use ketones as far as energy production is concerned. In fact, some people say there might be actually an efficiency, um, but, but that's a, a different conversation and, and has not been completely um, elucidated uh, as far as long-term effects is concerned. So that's where we are at this point. So now let's get into some of the information that's come to us of late. The data that's come to us of late is that uh, the general statement is that it seems to be that ketogenic diet is beneficial for the brain. And this information propagates itself because what we're dealing with is one of the scariest diseases to humanity. In mm -hmm. fact, when they do um, uh, questionnaires, when they give questionnaires to populations, especially elderly populations, they say what they fear the most and they always universally say Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. And since we don't have a cure for Alzheimer's and um, and prevention isn't a path, we, we've, we've talked about prevention quite a bit. There's quite a bit of data as far as prevention and plant-based diet and exercise and, and all of that stuff or plant-centered diet. Even if you just change your diet a bit, there's, there's significant benefit, but still is quite scary. So in that fear, especially people who already ha are in the thralls of, of Alzheimer's, they are open to anything that that gives evidence and th th there's no shortage of people giving evidence for um, a ketogenic diet seeming to be beneficial and and most of the benefits seem to come back as far as um, uh, uh, population based uh, not so much population based data but individual clinical studies mm -hmm. we literally don't have long term population based studies I'll start with that, and I will go into the details of the studies that we do have, but we literally don't have any populations that have been validated, meaning that people who have been shown through their blood that to achieve ketosis. The reason I say that is if anybody's tried ketogenic diet for a long period of time, they realize that it's not what we're used to. It's not where we live. In fact, there are no populations that, that have been validated to maintain ketogenic diet, even Eskimos, which that's the argument people use as, oh, but Eskimos, all they eat is fish. No, they, they've not been studied to show that they've maintained keto, ketogenic diet. By the way, the, those uh, initial studies that came back about ketogenic, uh, sorry, the Eskimos being healthier, that was not true. They are not healthier. There is a much, much, much higher risk of cardiovascular disease. They had done some autopsy studies on them, and they actually found out that they had atherosclerotic disease, which is hardening of their arteries quite a bit. Correct. So this is an important point short-term effects that Aisha is going to talk about and long-term effects. And then the, the, the third component on top of that, which we're interested is, in is, is, or is the given diet or lifestyle or activity or behavior that you're proposing, is it truly trans, translatable to populations? Mm -hmm. First of all, are there evidence that populations lived like this? And second of all, even if there isn't, how, can you even artificially create sustainable mechanisms that show that? That's that's the thing, and then then another thing that I want to allude to is what I what we spoke about earlier. What you're showing in a disease state is that even realistic in non-disease states? Just because um, this is not a bias, but just a reflection. Just because uh, chemotherapy works in cancers doesn't mean we're going to give chemo to all the population. Mm -hmm. So three levels: is it true at short term and long term? Is it translatable to populations and maintainable in populations? And fourth, is it a disease state intervention or a real life state intervention? So those are important concepts to discuss here. Yeah. So as far as the data on ketogenic diet and Alzheimer's disease is concerned, um, the main theory behind using ketogenic diet for Alzheimer's disease is that people who have Alzheimer's disease, they have some level of damage to their glucose metabolism and they're not able to use glucose as a source of energy so therefore ketone bodies are generated through this diet and that serves as energy for neurons to function so that's basically the main theory of why ketogenic diet has been used and like we mentioned earlier it's very low in carbohydrates mostly 10 percent or lower and 70 to 80 percent of it is fat and when you look at the body of data uh, that we've had for the past, say, 10 years, most of them have been conducted in patients with moderate to severe Alzheimer's disease. And the number of populations or the number of group of people that have 
gone through a ketogenic diet is very small in the studies in the studies and they usually have not looked at the effect of ketogenic diet beyond three months there was one study that looked at the effect of ketogenic diet and and in people for six months but there was so much attrition and the number actually just shrank by the end of the study that you know it didn't really seem to be a meaningful study. Um, one of the latest studies that has come to us is from Dr. Matthew Phillips in New Zealand. And that, I really like the study because it was a randomized crossover trial, which means that they placed people on a ketogenic diet. They compared two groups, one on a ketogenic diet and one on essentially a low fat, regularly healthy diet. So they didn't give them donuts or you know refined carbohydrates. They were on a lower fat, healthy eating guideline uh, based diet. And they enrolled them in a single phase blinded study, which means that nobody really knew what they were being given so that there was, you know, some elimination of uh, bias. And they went over um, their dietary um, and they went through a 12 week treatment period. And then they were separated by 10 week of washout period. So 12 week of ketogenic diet and then 10 week of washout and then 12 weeks of just regular diet. And they had some studies done on them, some testing done on them. The primary outcome was a particular type of cognitive examination called the ACE-3 or Addenbrooke's Cognitive Examination 3. And that's a pretty extensive Mm -hmm. cognitive assessment that looks at multiple domains of uh, cognition, including executive function, memory, attention, language, etc. They also did some quality of life um, testing, um, specifically uh, QOLAD or quality of life in Alzheimer's disease. And they also looked at ADCS, ADLs or AD cooperative study activities of daily living. And these are tests Dean, that you and I do in the clinic. Yeah. And what is what does that so, uh, show? So there are one set of tests that looks at cognition, the different domains of cognition, as you said, memory, executive function, uh, uh, visual spatial, attention, language. And, and there are diff- different ones that have different levels of, of uh, validity and, and, and th- they're more robust or less robust, meaning that they can detect um, cognitive decline a lot earlier and they can detect um, a change in, in a lot more subtly. Um, if they're more robust, they can do that. If they're less robust, then they can detect um, cognitive decline and dementia, but it has to be more advanced for to detect. The other problems that with these cognitive tests is what they call ceiling and floor effect. I'm not going to bore you guys too much, meaning that if it's ceiling is, if it's or too early, it doesn't have the capacity to detect early some symptoms. So it's not strong enough to detect early. Or floor effect, if the disease has progressed uh, quite a bit, it can't detect any change after that point. So those are not as important, but is it, it is important in this setting because the tests they choose and how they interpret those tests matter. And a lot of times for statistics, they say significant because the numbers that they looked at, there were 30 people, let's say, and they improved by one or two points on, let's say, MOCA, which is a very, very commonly used cognitive test. Montreal Cognitive Assessment Test. Yeah. It is clinically significant, but in reality, in real life, it changes one or two points over three months. Really can't make too much of that in 30 people. That's true. So we get a lot of that. We get a lot of studies that look at that level of sensitivity where 30 people were followed for three months and they improved or by by the measurer's uh, terms, improved by one or two points. And that that really means not doesn't mean much as far as uh, clinical practice is concerned, as far as populations are concerned. The more robust ones, yes, they might reflect something, but if it's not done long term, again, not doesn't reflect anything meaningful. And none of these, again, I, I want to make sure that we emphasize this point, have been tested long term. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, so something that shows short term doesn't mean long term benefit. Now, the functional measures, which is ADLs and AD, uh, IADLs, are how you're living. You know, Mm. how you're uh, um, driving, how you're uh, doing your finances, how you're taking your medications, how you're doing, you know, uh, house cleaning or answering phones. Those are somewhat subjective, but we still use them because it's a quality of life kind of a thing. 
Um, and and there are less objective. Right. I just wanted to give you a kind of a picture of all this. And I think that's really important because, say, for example, ACE 3, this cognitive assessment test, you know, it, the total score is, correct me if I'm wrong, it's 100. Yeah, 80 times. And yeah. normal score is if you score 82 out of 100, right? Correct. And in this particular study, so these individuals went over 12 weeks of um, the ketogenic diet and they looked at their cognitive scores. There were 26 patients in the study, out of which 21 of them completed the ketogenic diet. There was one withdrawal because of you know just some side effects of ketogenic diet, which is fine. And they all achieved ketosis. That's the other thing. You know, me measuring beta hydroxybutyrate levels was appropriate. Um, in some of the other studies, they never even reached ketosis because Correct. it's such a difficult diet to stick to it's so funny they say that ketogenic diet but then they never speak about the fact that whether they reached and maintained ketosis exactly so in this study they actually did well they were very strict and they did sustain physiological um, ketosis for 12 weeks now as far as the results are concerned compared to the usual diet um, the individuals who were on a ketogenic diet they did not show any significant changes in their ACE3 or the cognitive assessment test. There was an increase of about three points, but it didn't reach, um, you know, uh, significance, which means the p-value was 0.2. It didn't reach 0 0.01 or 0 0.05. And that's important because, like you said, the small little changes in score here and there could potentially be because of some other issues, don't you think? I oh, mean, absolutely. The, sometimes you know there's uh, when the the bias of paying more attention, or you know, simple measures like having a better night's sleep, or for example, making sure that there have there is some support system that tells them to do better. The conversations that they have, that their energy level at that particular day. You know, one or two scores is something that probably is not specific at all. And especially with single arm studies where there's no control uh, or even when there is control, if there's any difference in the uh, in the implementation, let's say that one uh, group is um, uh, in diet intervention and the other one is just regular food. Well, yes, you're controlling, but the observer effect is not there. The observer is more involved in the intervention and not in the other one. Yeah, so that's so, important. Can you expand on the observer effect? Yeah. So when, when, when you're doing a study, let's say that it's two arms, control and intervention. If the controls are just given regular diet and, and then just measured, yet the intervention group is given an alternate diet, which they already know there's a change. There's a whole thing phenomenon, the uh, placebo, I call it placebo plus, which is when you're told that there's a change, the assumption is that the change is good. Right. Not, but, not, but for a lot of studies, they blind the assessors. So. Course, but, but that's what drugs. With food, it's going to be very difficult to do, to do blinding. Right. If you know you're getting fat, fatty food, lots of fat, there's not much ways you, that you can blind right, the right. situation. Yeah. Absolutely. So that, that, those are all factors to take into consideration. And over time, a lot of these uh, studies were single arm. And even when were, they were blinded, like we said, uh, blinding is very difficult when it comes to diet. Now, that's true not just for ketogenic, but for all diet studies, mm -hmm. all intervention studies. It's it's a, it's a difficult thing to uh, to blind unless you create powders or bars where people don't know that 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 one thing is um, a particular type of food or another. Again, the short of it is there is very little data as far as ketogenic diet that. Um, that that in, even in three months, or th that you keep hearing this. I mean, it's it's incredible that when you talk, when you listen to the talking heads on social media, it's almost like as if it's a foregone conclusion that ketogenic diet improves brain health. Right, and sometimes the thing that we frequently hear is like, okay, so maybe the results were not significant, but like this study showed that there was some improvement in their activities of daily living or in their quality of life over that 12 week when they were on ketogenic diet. And that's good enough for them to be on ketogenic diet. What would you say to that? The concept of good enough or the fact that anything that you intervene with that, that has brought some change is a dangerous one. This is a, this is a grift, um, a scientific grift that's been employed in, especially now in the social media realm quite a bit. Oh, you know, it's better than nothing. Right. You know, right. it's hope. It's this. 
No, because you can actually misdirect science, research, populations for a long time with appearance of benefit without true benefit. Yeah. It's, it's important that we hold ourselves accountable and, and have a measure of scrutiny to make sure that the data we're representing is truly representing change in brain function and not a feeling, not a, a measure of hope. I know that in a disease like Alzheimer's where there's, it is absolutely devastating. And I don't need to say this to you guys. You've heard this us a million times saying that we went through this with our own grandparents and there's nothing more painful. Right. And each single pa patient we see is our grandparent. Yeah. We, we make sure that we don't um, de become desensitized to the pain and suffering. So given, we know that hope is needed. But the best form of hope is appropriate science because Agreed. that will come, that will actually lead to meaningful, realistic outcomes. So just because people feel better, it doesn't mean that it's, it's, it's anything meaningful or it will even do any good long-term, often damage long-term because it will slow real science. And there's a lot of subjectivity in the conclusions of some of these studies too. Like for example, in this one, in the conclusion, there's a statement that says, compared with usual diet supplemented with low fat, healthy eating guidelines, patients on a ketogenic diet improved in daily function and quality of life two factors of great importance to people living with dementia, period. That's it. Yeah, so, so ended it with a big subjective. But it, exactly. <clears throat> but, you know, I think it's important for us to highlight that we actually don't have good enough evidence to show that ketogenic diet makes a huge difference as far as cognitive function is concerned. And when they've looked at long-term um, uh, ketogenic diet um, data, or at least a... I'm going to say that again. But when they've looked at the circumstances of continuing patients on a ketogenic diet, it's almost impossible, isn't it? It's a difficult diet to maintain because, first of all, you're reducing complex carbohydrates significantly and people are not used to it. The feeling of weakness, the feeling of uh, increased hunger, there's actually been some studies that show that when people have cut down on their complex carbohydrate intake, they actually have a tendency to want more sugary foods, to want more um, you know, fatty foods. All of that is important. Um, I don't want to jump into the side effects and some of the problems that people um, have experienced. We'll do that in a bit. But that's a huge issue too, especially with people who have cognitive impairment. First of all, they can't do it by themselves, right? There has to be someone, a caregiver to do that for them. Yeah. Second, there's a lot of discomfort and stress involved with it too. Correct. I mean, the, the, the viability of a diet or lifestyle has to be taken in consideration. But I'll go, actually, I'll give them this. If it truly is a treatment, well, by the way, that has never been, that claim has never been made. Let's say, but it, but if it is truly a treatment, it should be spoken about. It Absolutely. should be looked at. It should be um, studied deeply. And, and for those people who are willing to do it, that should be implemented. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so yes, it's, it's difficult. It's, it's, um, it's, um, there are no evidence. There's no evidence of populations being able to implement uh, such a change in their life long term, but it should be studied. So what do we have? There is some evidence um, in short-term studies that there is some measure of change, cognition towards the benefit. Um, um, uh, but again, none of this has been translated long-term. None of this has been truly validated in a bigger studies, any major big studies, uh, double-blinded, double-armed to show uh, that, that this has benefit even uh, in short-term. And, and more importantly, um, uh, a lot of these studies, m every one that we looked at, they had small numbers. Mm -hmm. They had very small numbers. So, so it, it speaks to whether one can count on it. Right. Now, two factors. Can you reach ketosis? There's evidence that reaching ketosis is possible. It's, it can be difficult, but it's actually much more difficult than most people think. A lot of the uh, uh, young people that I meet who say they go into keto diet, and when we speak to them, we know for certain they're not in ketosis because they have some more than 50 grams of carbohydrates and they have a lot of protein. So they're getting uh, uh, their uh, uh, you know, ketosis uh, altered by all these other foods that they're eating. So one, one is that. There's also some evidence that MCTs uh, as, as a supplement might help 
right. reach ketosis. Again, it's be beginning, it's preliminary, but there's some evidence of that. So that should be studied further. Exactly. We do have some evidence and there's been some studies that looked at supplementation of medium chain triglyceride um, supplementation or any beta hydroxybutyrate containing supplements in addition to a standard diet um, affecting cognition to a certain extent. So that's something that is emerging and we will keep an eye on it and it needs to be studied more, but there seems to be some signal. Yeah. And that is one of the things that is different now. We do have some data to it. So it, obviously we have to make sure that we have more evidence for that, supporting the fact that MCT oil or beta hydroxybutyrate supplementation can be added to a standard diet for patients who have cognitive impairment in Alzheimer's disease, as well as Parkinson's uh, dementia as well. But all in all, I think given that we have tremendous amount of um, data on, say, for example, the efficacy of Mediterranean diet or the MIND diet or diets that are predominantly plant-based. We have all that data showing that people who consume that not only can prevent neurodegenerative diseases, but they can actually slow down the progression of Alzheimer's disease. Let's stick to that instead of introducing something that is not very solid right now. I mean, we have a major study coming from Rush University few years ago that showed that a, a MIND diet, which is a plant predominant diet, reduced your risk of Alzheimer's by 53%. Mm -hmm. That wasn't a short term, that wasn't a small study, that was a major study. And then we have the Advanced Health Study, we have the California Teacher Study where you looked at Mediterranean diet, but in all of them, the common theme is more plants, more plants, more plants, more plants, Exactly. and less saturated fat. That's a common theme. Studies have shown that when you have saturated fat and high cholesterol as a consequence, which are hand in hand, then you have higher rates of dementia. In fact, in one study, higher cholesterol led to 57% greater risk of Alzheimer's. And even moderate high cholesterol led to a 35% higher risk of dementia. Absolutely. And so all this data is there. Now, again, I, just for sake of being uh, transparent and, and clear about science of things, this should be studied. A ketogenic diet should be studied long term, uh, at, at larger studies, and and with um, unbiased parties, um, third parties that look at the data and look at the intervention, making sure that people have reached ketosis. Looking at cognitive tests that are meaningful, uh, because even if it's not for the general population, it might be for a subset that have already dementia, just like in seizures. We might be um, uh, who benefit from uh, well, not all seizures, but intractable seizures. They benefit from ketogenic diet. Maybe, by the way, this has not been proven. Maybe from a set for a set subset of dementia patients, this might be beneficial. Mm -hmm. But that should be studied and looked at. By yeah. the way, ketogenic diet is not just one type where you eat meat and processed foods. You can have a plant based. Ketogenic diet. Exactly. Yeah. I was about to say that it would be wonderful to actually look at the comparison of, say, for example, a, a mind diet, which you know has been proven to slow down um, neurodegenerative disease, prevent neurodegenerative disease, and also the Mediterranean diet that has been proven to slow down the progression of the disease, comparing mind and the Mediterranean diet to ketogenic diet. Because I think one of the things that um, has not really been studied well is the comparison of dietary patterns. Maybe ketogenic diet was given to individuals who were on a standard Western diet, and that includes a lot of processed foods and refined carbohydrates, and anything is better than that, obviously. But what if people are actually on a healthy diet with higher poly and monounsaturated fats, lower refined carbohydrates, lots of fiber from a plant-based uh, or a plant-predominant diet, and um, you know other micronutrients that are derived from uh, plant foods. Uh, comparing that to ketogenic diet, that's what I would love to see. Dr. Phillips actually looked at you know the low-fat, healthier dietary pattern, but it would be neat to look at the mind diet compared to ketogenic diet. Absolutely, I, I think the fact that uh, those kind of studies have not been done is because they're expensive. Agreed. But I think in the bigger scheme of things, if you can reverse the the underlying causes of cognitive decline or uh, um, um, reduce risk of dementia, the costliest disease in America and the West. We're talking about $500 billion direct and indirect cost compared to heart disease, which is $120 billion. By the way, this will also affect heart disease. So why not invest in a study where you have a plant predominant clean diet, you have a Mediterranean mind diet, 
and then you have a ketogenic diet and mm -hmm. see the comparison and, and a fourth arm the regular standard diet because you would need something uh, that, that extreme exactly yeah. and then look at which one is beneficial i think as far as cost analysis that would be the most effective uh, spending I agree. because whatever it costs it's going to be less than 500 billion dollars which just on dementia that we're spending each year yeah yeah uh, so that's the i think the path to go yeah no i i think we need some variation of kevin hall's study for dementia where he looked at ketogenic diet and you know regular low-fat uh plant-based diet and it was isocaloric and you know there was really no difference as far as um the insulin model was concerned and you know the effects were incredible people were actually getting less calories when they were on a plant-based diet compared to ketogenic diet but in any case i think it would be wonderful if we study this further um can we talk a little bit about you know some of the side effects of people being on a ketogenic diet because you know it's fine if people want to try it but they have to be seriously concerned or at least not concerned but aware of some of the side effects that people could potentially experience being on a ketogenic diet and that has been studied quite a bit yeah um so we have some data and but where it has been studied it's been an epilepsy patient agree and yes. the main most common one is bone abnormalities kidney problems mm -hmm. inflammation and uh, things of that nature right. um, so those are the more common uh side effects. You know, yeah yeah in, in some of the recent studies on ketogenic diet among seniors with uh, alzheimer's disease the one issue that is prominent is malnutrition you know people actually start losing weight uh, because of their just general aging and not being able to consume too much too many calories on a ketogenic diet um, malnutrition specifically for specific types of micronutrients obviously those can be replaced with um, you know vitamins but there is uh, a big loss of muscle mass when people are on a ketogenic diet. Yeah, and because remember, it's not a high protein diet. Agreed. Yes, absolutely. And um, especially seniors who have uh, dementia, they um, have lack of appetite to begin with, and they tend to have some swallowing abnormalities. And so restricting their diet to a ketogenic diet can you know, further increase some complications later on as well. And these have been validated. These have been actually mentioned in multiple different studies. In uh, most of the studies, the, 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 in most of the studies, some of the, you know, highlighted uh, side effects were nervousness, fatigue, um, muscle cramps, constipation, their increased desire to eat sugary food. So they actually start craving carbohydrates. Those have been characterized and, and um, reported. Some of the less uh, prominent ones and rare ones are hypoglycemia, vomiting and nausea, calcium being on the lower side, their triglycerides and fat levels being on the higher side. Again, like you said, we haven't really studied it long enough to look at the effect of what that high fat does, but there are studies that show that when people have high LDL cholesterol, they tend to have high, um, you know, higher level of vascular damage. And we know that brain is a very vascular organ. So we're actually damaging our arteries by increasing our triglycerides and our um, LDL levels, aren't we? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. So, um, so those were the side effects. And um, I think in the conclusion, it's important uh, for us to acknowledge that there are some signals and some effects of ketogenic diet on brain health. And especially when it comes to supplementation of beta-hydroxybutyrate containing um, supplements. Um, but we don't have long-term data and we need longer studies, and we need good comparisons with diets that have been proven to prevent cognitive impairment or slow down cog Alzheimer's disease. And, and the, the big statement I think that we both agree on is that at this point, to change any individual or definitely at the population level to change from diets that have been proven to be incredibly healthy, a plant predominant, plant centered, diet is by far the most effective diet that's been proven repeatedly, whether it's in the context of uh, a vegan uh, uh, whole food plant-based diet or Mediterranean diet uh, or uh, mind diet, all of them, the dominant elements are greens, beans, legumes, cruciferous vegetables, whole nuts, grains. whole grains. Uh, you know, those are the things that, with lots of fiber that have been shown to be profoundly effective. There are many population-based um, uh, uh, populations that have actually lived in this kind of diet. So that's a achievable diet at population level. 
and it's and it's healthy not just for the brain but for all aspects of living be it cardiovascular diabetes and, and cancer as well the Adventist health studies has shown this the um, uh, a California teacher study has shown this. We've done many studies in, in all of these databases. Northern Manhattan Northern, study. Yeah, there yeah. are multiple different databases that show that the Mediterranean diet or the mind diet or a diet that is predominantly plant. So when we say Mediterranean and mind diet, it's essentially a variation of the same theme, which means more plants, more whole grains, more beans, more nuts and seeds, and less saturated fats that are derived from animal products. And, and simple sugars or, or refined, refined sugars. Carbohydrates, carbohydrates, absolutely. Yeah. So that's the critical thing. To, to, to even consider anything alternative at this point without the meaningful data, short-term or long-term, which we don't have, is, is re irresponsible to us. We are completely open to this diet, which is ketogenic diet, or any others that come in the future. But it has to pass certain bars before we can apply it to populations. And when you speak about it in social media, you're doing public health. When any talking head goes out there and speaks about a particular diet on, on social media, they're doing massive harm or good at the public health level. You cannot negate the benefits of a plant-predominant, plant-centered diet with short-term data that's not been shown to be profoundly effective. And and the studies are uh, marginal, weak, and not and 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 definitely nothing long term. Uh, that those all those parameters uh, uh, should give you a warning, so which disturbs us given that kind of disparity of data, both population, long term, short term, clinical trials, randomized clinical, the amount of. Um, um, airtime that it's getting, um, um, be it in, on magazines or on, on TV or on social media, is quite disturbing because we would be doing damage at this point. Do, why do you think people are so drawn to ketogenic diet? Do you think it, it's the idea that a quick fix or something that works uh, rapidly and essentially comes under the realm of a fad diet? I, I hesitate to call ketogenic diet a fad diet, but I think it does fall in that category right now, doesn't it? Yeah, so I think it's two factors going on, two psychological factors, which usually it's if, if somebody gives me something tangible, measurable, well circumscribed to do or not do, that's easier mm -hmm. than changing entire lifestyle. I mean, even with the whole food plant base, we don't we don't say just that. It, it's going to take some work, small steps. That's why the Neuro Academy, we, we talk about an environment where we actually slowly inculcate. There are some steps back and forth, back and forth until people find themselves in the healthy lifestyle. That, that, that's complicated, but it's necessary. And that means that public conversations that are meaningful and data driven, and, and we just describe what data means. So ease, you know, give blueberries. How often have we heard people come to our clinic and say, Dr. Sherza, you know, I'm doing so well. I'm having two cups of blueberries a day. Okay, that's fantastic. There's no question blueberries are great. But what about the rest of the diet? Oh, I'm still having, you know, processed foods and burgers and fries and this and that. I'm like, okay, so no, there's, first of all, there's no superfood. There are some foods that are, have greater anti-inflammatory index, greater, you know, omega-3 and all of this stuff, certain nutrients and others, but there are no superfoods. It's, the dietary pattern that you lead that's important. So that's harder. Right, oh, by the way, it's right. not just diet either. Exercising, stress management, sleep, better sleep. Wow, you're just making my life difficult. Just give me the blueberries. <laughs> or just let me eat not, you know, eat not eat one thing and eat another group of things. Right. That sounds good. Right. Oh, and then the second one is, you know, that statement. People love hearing good news about their bad habits. I know for a fact that a lot of young men, yes, I'm picking on you young men because uh, I'm a young man. Uh, yes, I am a young man. <laughs> but but uh, they want to hear that bacon is medicine. By the way, you cannot prove that no matter how vociferous, how outspoken you are. It's not. It's not good for you. Uh, uh, processed foods are not good for you. Um, uh, simple carbs are not good for or you. Or butter. Or butter, yeah. So... Uh, so since we like hearing good news about our bad habits, we listen to people that will give you ma evidence that your bad habit's good. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a guy out there calling himself Liver King. There's no data 
and he's got m hundreds of thousands of followers. Oh, millions, millions. Because he's basically saying eat meat, which people want to hear. And or he's organ got organ meat. An organ yeah. meat. And it's unique, it's interesting, it's it's doing one thing, which is the organ meat, and you don't have to worry about the rest of your foods. Oh, by the way, he actually sells paleolithic supplements too. Paleolithic supplements. Okay. Yeah. So that's... Or ancestral vitamins. And then, yeah. I, I don't, so I those do... two concepts, which is uh, <laughs> doing one thing that's well-defined, that doing or not doing, even the, uh, you know. And then the other one is, especially if it's aligned with what you want, which is meat is, fat is. Um, but the people don't realize after eating true ketogenic diet for a while, it get, becomes a little overwhelming to them just even from a proclivity side, from a tendency side, becomes overwhelming. So if we kind of change that mindset, saying we're not biased, what data has been shown to be beneficial, what data has been shown to be applicable to populations, and, 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 and by benefit, I mean short and especially long term, mm -hmm. and then we will have a better way of actually um, addressing this phenomenon um, of, of diet. And it's, and it's not going to be a one-off diet. It's not going to be a new year resolution. It's going to be a meaningful change. Beautiful. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, guys.